Good morning, everyone. How are we doing this morning? Good, good. You're awake and alive. I like it. Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers and grandmas, aunties, sisters, those who have filled the role of mom. We celebrate you this morning, but we're going to worship. So go ahead and stand and join us as we sing. Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Sing it out. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name. in his freedom. I love that line. And speaking of dancing, we're going to let you sit so you don't have to dance. How's that? I just want to welcome you to East Point and I just want to extend another happy Mother's Day to all the moms in the room. Can we just give it up for the moms? Good job. Hopefully you received our handsome ushers. We're passing out a little gift we have for the moms. If you didn't receive one of those, make sure you grab one out of the basket on your way out today. It's just a little something. 
to remind you that you're valued and loved and cherished. And also, on your way out, there's a little photo booth in the front lobby, and we'd love for you to stop and take some pictures and get your family gathered together and have some photo op moments for that. And then also in the lobby, speaking of motherhood, there are all things we refer to as unplanned pregnancies. And maybe you noticed in the lobby, there's the baby bee bottle table set up. We are kicking off the campaign for making, bringing awareness and raising funds for Life Services, who is a great, great place for unplanned pregnancies, both supporting women, unplanned pregnancies, and the men as well. So we want to have you pick up a baby bottle, take it home, and fill it with your change, and it's got all the instructions inside and when to bring it back and all that good stuff, but we want to support those who are caring for those physically and emotionally that are facing some of those unplanned pregnancies. And then also, speaking of kids, if you didn't know it, we have our uh, full Child care. Our full Epic Kids ministry is open on the 9 a.m. service as, 11, as a well at the 11. So it's birth through fifth grade. So if you have kiddos, you can bring them at the 9 a.m. service now as well. And then I want you to open up your Bible or your version Bible app on your phone and find us. And I'm going to give you quick, brief instructions how you do that. So if you open up your phone, open up the Version Bible app, there's three little lines on there that you click on, and that's the more button. Once you click on the more button, open events, and then events will pop up East Point Church Live. If you click on that, you've opened up your world to East Point. There's all things on there that we have coming up for you, places where you can register for things, you can give there, as well as put in some prayer requests. If there's something you want us to partner with and pray for you, please do that. But I want to highlight a couple of things that we have. East Point Intro to Community, May 23rd, two weeks from today. If you haven't taken that, we would love for you to join Pastor Kurt and I as we tell you all things East Point, what you can expect for you, for your next steps at East Point, who we are, what we believe, why we believe it, and so on and so forth. So that'll be immediately following the second service around 1230, 1245, we'll get started. And then Intro to Peace on June 6th. If you are curious about what we do for missions and how we approach missions here at East Point, then that's the class for you. It's all things here that you can do and then near in our community as well as far and partnering with um, what we do in Africa. So be sure to put that on your calendar. That will also be following the second service on June 6th. And then come back next week because Pastor Kurt is kicking off a new series about rest, taking a pause, and how to find rest in this chaotic culture. So be sure to come back for that three-part series. And now I am going to kick off and invite you to do something that we are commanded to do. And you know what? I do this without apology. We do this every week because God commands us to. And let me just read where this command is. It says, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. I love with the best parts of everything you produce. So often we wait and see what's left over and what we have to give to God, but God says, I want your best. I want the beginning of what I've given you. So today we invite you to do that, and when you give, you are in partnering with East Point and reaching people, reaching the lost and loving the found, so we can't do that without you. So I encourage you to live up to that command that God calls us to so that we can be a better body of Christ in the long run. And then speaking of command, we're also commanded to worship It's in the scriptures that God says, worship me. So I'm going to invite you to stand. And as we turn our attention to worship, I'm going to ask that we can lay aside all the distractions because God wants and deserves our full attention. Not only because we get to worship him and praise him for who he is, but because we receive something in return. So Lord, I pray as we enter back into worship, that as we turn our attention to you, that you Father, will empty us of ourselves and fill us with more of you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's sing.
cross that leaves no question of the measure of his love. Come on, sing this out. Our chains are gone. Our chains are gone. Our debt is paid. The cross. us here, that you would speak to us in this moment, Lord. We love you. We cherish you. Jesus, my
wherever you are and I can see it you're the light in the dark you are you are you are oh there's power when I say your name and I can feel it cause you're breaking the chain
we love you and we praise you more this morning thank you for everything that you've done for us for overcoming death itself and giving us new life you're so good and we just want to be with you we love you Lord we praise you be with us speak to us this morning It's in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you so much for singing with us. You can go ahead and take a seat and take a look at the screens. I'm so bored, I wish I had something to do. (sighs) Thanks for letting me sleep in, kids. If you make a mess in the kitchen, please let me know so I can clean it up. Raising kids is so easy. I just love driving around all day. Oh, I never have to repeat myself. They always listen so carefully. Oh, look, an empty box of cereal. Love it. Just wipe it on your sleeve. It's pretty cold, but you don't need a coat. Oh, you don't have to push in your chair. Don't make your bed, you're just gonna sleep in it again later. I think I'll skip the coffee today. You know, these throw pillows look way better on the floor. I'm really not that busy. Well, you haven't showered in three days, but I think you smell great. We do have food at home, but let's just go out to eat. Just brush your teeth whenever you feel like it. Here, take my phone charger and go put it in your room. Oh, just leave your dirty dishes on the counter. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's all pull out our phones. Youth sports are so cheap. Braces are so cheap. School fees are so cheap. Hey, can you come crawl in bed with me around 2 a.m.? Thanks. Okay, I just spent two hours making dinner, but if you don't like it, that's fine. Just let me know and I'll make you something else. Don't even bother looking for that. I'm sure it's lost and gone forever. Can somebody please throw something at my head? I mean, I can keep track of every single one of your things. I get a ton of sleep. I get a ton of gratitude from my children. I get a ton of unsolicited help with the housework. Oh, you don't have to hurry up. We're gonna be right on time. Can someone please throw something at the TV? Thanks for doing the laundry, everyone. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you use your outside voice? Ah! Fight, fight, fight! The floor of this vehicle is so clean, I can't believe it. Oh, good. Another trip to the grocery store today. Let's go. Hey, I'm gonna hop in the shower. Does somebody want to come use the bathroom while I'm in here? (laughs) Oh, my goodness. That's awesome. Well, happy Mother's Day to the moms, grandmas, and moms in waiting. We are so glad you're here watching online. Last week, I was down in Southern California on a a week where I spent some time, worked on the message all the way through September. Excited this summer, we're going to do a series on Revelation called uh, The End of the World as We Know It. And then following that, we're going to do a series on some Old Testament Bible characters called They Walk Before Us. So excited about all that, but I watched online last week, and our guys did such a great job, the tech team, the camera team, so would you give it up for those guys, because they really, they're kind of behind everything, so thank you guys. Well, traditionally on Mother's Day, a pastor should probably talk about what it means to be a mom or about motherhood, Uh, but it struck me in thinking that perhaps a more appropriate topic today would be to address the issue of what kind of uh, men, husbands, and fathers our wives deserve. 
In other words, how can we be the best we can to bless them, to honor them, and to love them? Not just today. This is a special day. But not just today, but every day. So we're going to talk about how to love that woman. We'll be in Ephesians chapter 5. You've got your Bible or your Bible app. Open up to Ephesians chapter 5. Or if you've got the U version again, we'll, you'll follow along and see the outline right there. Now, ladies, let me give you a little, a little sneak peek on this. Um, I'm going to ask you to not beat up the guy sitting next to you. No rib poking today. No, uh, <clears throat> as I'm talking, just uh, smile and pray a lot. So please be nice to them. But men, the Bible does give you some very specific and important things to do. Uh, very specific things to do. In fact, the Word provides us with some clear direction about how to live with your wife and the mother of your children. The big idea today, the thing I want you to walk away with is this. Every wife... And mother deserves a husband that will be her greatest fan and biggest hero. Every wife and mom, every wife deserves a husband. And every uh, mom deserves children who will be their greatest fan and biggest hero. And so I'm going to suggest some ways to best honor and cherish your wife in a way that Jesus does for all of us. The letter to the church in Ephesus is full of some relational and practical instructions. It's one of my favorite epistles. I don't know how many times, hundreds of times that I've read that letter, but I love it. But there are some very specific things in Ephesians 5 and 6. But I want to focus on what the men are to do. And we're going to pick it up in Ephesians 5, verse 25. Ephesians 5, 25 to 31 this morning. Listen up, guys. Here's what the word says. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, I could stop right there and said, just do that every day and you're going to be awesome because that's probably enough said. But I'm going to unpack, as Paul does, what that looks like. Husband, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave herself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Verse 28, in the same way. It's talking to the men in the same way. Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife uh, loves himself. We'll unpack that in just a moment. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. Verse 31, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Revealed in this passage of Scripture, are some clear guidelines, very clear. I'm going to unpack just three of them, but some clear guidelines about how to meet her needs. And here's number one, love her till it hurts. Love her till it hurts. And by that, I don't mean till it hurts them. I mean until it hurts you. The Bible speaks of three kinds of love, at least. Now, in the English language, we have one word, love. And it can mean lots of different things. I love the fact that in the New Testament, there are actually three different words used to define and describe love. One of them is eros, that's romantic love. We get in English, uh, the word erotic from that, but that's romantic love. Phileo, which is friendship love, the love that you would have with a companion or friend. It's companionship love. And then agape love. And if you've been around the church any time of all, you've heard the phrase agape. But it's a term that's, uh, that means selfless and unconditional love. Selfless and unconditional love. And agape love is unconditional and sacrificial love uh, commitment to an imperfect person. Let me say that again. Agape love is an unconditional and sacrificial commitment to an imperfect person, meaning it is self-giving rather than self-serving no matter what. Yep, that woman sitting next to you has got her own issues and things and some baggage, and she's imperfect just like you are. But un unconditional love is, is loving that person no matter what. It's loving others when it costs you to love them, and even when it hurts. And guess what kind of love that Paul refers to here in Ephesians chapter 5? Yep, guys, it's agape love. It's love that requires us to die. Jesus loved us enough to die for us even though we were far from perfect. He loved you and me enough to die for us even when we were and still are far from perfect. Look at verse 25 again. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Just as Jesus loved the church. Well, how did he demonstrate that love best of all? He died for us. Just as Jesus loved us with an unconditional and sacrificial love, imperfect as we are, men, you're to love your wives in the same way. You're to love them in the same way. In fact, it is your first and greatest responsibility to her is to love her. You're to demonstrate your love by putting the needs of your wife before your own. You're to demonstrate your love by being kind and gracious, even when you're right and she's wrong. Sometimes we make it all about being right and we forget that being relational is more important. And even when she's 100% wrong and you're 100% right, we still are called to be 
loving and to love that person. Remember, agape love is unconditional love for an imperfect person. Unconditional means it's not performance-based. Well, if you would just do this, 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 and this, then I would love you more. Nope. Unconditional love means I love you no matter what. And it's love for an imperfect person. And you best demonstrate that, your love, by selfless acts of sacrifice for her, just like Jesus did for you and me. I don't make a habit of watching Dr. Phil, but one day I was at home. It was quite a while ago. I was actually not feeling well. I was channel surfing, looking for something to do. And I came across, is he even still on TV? I don't know. Is he? Okay, some of you do watch him, but it's all right. But uh, Dr. Phil, I, I was watching him, and he, you know how he is. It's a little bit too much drama for me at times. But he said this statement. It caught my attention. I'd scribble it down. He said, once he said, Frank Sinatra may have been the greatest singer ever, the greatest crooner ever, but being proud of doing it my way is just plain stupid. You can hear Dr. Phil saying that, right? Being proud of doing it my way is just plain stupid. There is no getting around the fact that God requires you as a husband to lay your life down. And to truly love is to truly die. Hello. To truly love is to truly die. There's so much. Jesus not only demonstrated that, but even said, greater love has no man than this, and they lay down his life for his friends. And that woman sitting next to you ought to be your best friend. To truly love is to truly die. That's what Jesus did. And you demonstrate your love by giving your very best to her and for her. God did not give his second best. Aren't you glad? He's like, I need anybody, any angels want to volunteer? You, the scrawny one on the back. How about, no, no. He gave his very best. He gave his one and only son. And your wife deserves your very best as well, guys. She deserves, deserves your best. Not your leftover time, not your leftover energy, not your leftover love. To love her like Jesus loved you is to give your very best. And one more thing, you demonstrate your love by what you say to her and about her. It's kind of a big deal to me, and it's also an area that I consistently have to repent of my own failure in, so I own this. But you demonstrate your love best by what you say to her and about her. Look at verse 26 again. It's kind of an odd verse if you don't understand what the, what's going on here. He says, make her holy. That means special, set apart. Make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. The Apostle Paul is using this beautiful word picture here of Jesus refreshing and restoring us, you and me, his bride, by the cleansing waters of his word. When Jesus speaks to you, he never says, you're stupid, you're an idiot, you're a fool, I don't like you, I don't have time for you, what's kind of idiot, I, what's wrong with you? He, does, he speaks to you in a way that cleanses you, refreshes, and re re restores you. His word is healing to us. His word is beneficial and restorative. It is refreshing. His word makes us whole and gives us life. Yes, sometimes it's challenging. And I get that. But your wife should have, your words toward your wife should have the same powerful effect. Listen to these truths from the book of Proverbs. Solomon wrote this, Proverbs 12, 18. Reckless words pierce like a sore, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Reckless, foolish words said harshly and, and without thinking. They cut people and they cut your spouse. But the tongue of the wise, the words of the wise, brings wholeness and healing. Proverbs 15, 4, the tongue that brings healing is a tree of life, but a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. And one more, Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue has the power of life and death. What is he saying? He says, you have the power with your words to speak life into that woman or to speak death to her. And what we say about our wives and how we say it truly is a big deal. A friend of mine once told me this. He said, I can tell how a man speaks to his wife just by looking at her. And I'll never forget it because it struck me. He said, wow, that's really true. He said, I can tell how a man treats, speaks to his wife just by looking at her. Is she emotionally cut up and crushed or is she whole and full of life? Gentlemen, the word of God. This is not the word of Kurt. The word of God in our lives calls us to some challenging things at times and corrects us. I get that. But it's full of grace and truth. And it always is, the intent is to build us up, to bring wholeness and healing. And your words to that woman always, always needs to bring healing and wholeness. Some time ago, my dear wife was struggling with something on her computer and I explained it to her. You know, I'm, you know guys, we fix things. So I explained what she needed to do. And she got frustrated with me. And it's not working. I tried it. And, and, and this is... <laughs> Actually, this is something that kind of happens for, happened for a long time on an ongoing basis. And finally, I just like, I said, you are such a computer idiot. Yeah. Let me just say that did not build her up. 
That did not encourage her. That actually did not help her. And in fact, it made her want to deck me. And it did not end well that particular moment. I'm here to tell you, it made us both pretty miserable. Sometimes I say really stupid things. Don't do that. I don't know why it's so easy to blow it here. But I know getting good at this, watching what we say and how we say it to our wives, is one of the most important ways that you can meet her needs and demonstrate your love. It's one of the most important ways. Now, don't just be, you know, um, she, she wants genuine words, genuine affection. She wants you to speak w encouraging things that you truly do believe. But we always have an opportunity. We can say something like, you're a computer idiot or honey, I'm so glad that I'm here to help you. It does sound a little bit better, yeah. Honey, I, I, I know you're struggling with this. I'm so sorry this is frustrating you. I flew on a plane recently, and as you can imagine, from California. And it was funny. On one of the flights, the flight attendants, I won't mention the Delta, I mean the airline, but one of the attendants, they were just so nice and wonderful and kind and supportive, and their tone was, was like they're speaking to adults. On the other flight, one of the, and I got a survey, and, I, and I, I, I told them, I said, this guy needs to be trained, retrained, or retired because he was just mean. His words were harsh. And it was like he was talking down to you. and Like he's treating you like a kindergartner. How many of you enjoy being, when someone speaks down to you? When they're condescending to you? Nobody does. Even if you're wrong. I had my head rest up. I get it. I'm not supposed to do that. And he came up behind me and shoved it down and said, This is supposed to be down as it goes into my shoulder and hurt me. I'm going to sue them. <laughs> no. I'm not, Probably. But anyhow, my point is, is how we say it. He could have just said, listen, I'm sorry, sir. I realize that that headrest at your height probably hits you in the wrong place, but it needs to be down for takeoff. Can I help you? You see the difference? Tone, not just words, by the way, but tone and attitude and everything behind it matters. Guys, I'm, I'm going to move on, but I need you to think about what you say and how you say it to your wife. All right, here's the second thing you could do. Number two, pamper her with tender, loving care. Pamper her with TLC. Look at verse 25. Uh, excuse me, 28. I love this. Paul says, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Hmm. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. This says that you are to love your wife in the same way that you love yourself. Treat her with the same TLC, tender loving care, that you give to your own body. Now, I know some of you ladies are thinking, can he do a little bit better than that, please? Because you're like, I'm not sure he really does that good to his own body. I, you know, I used to backpack all the time, and I would go sometimes for four, five, six, seven days and backpacking trip, and I may have gotten in a lake once, perhaps, but I would come home, my clothes were just grimy, my hair was hat head and greasy, and I smelled, and I smelled so bad, I didn't even know I smelled bad. And, and I, I was not the epitome of a stud for my wife at that moment. And so I'm, you don't treat your wife that way. Treat her with tender, loving care. Treat her with a way that really makes her feel special. Most of the time, though, most of us guys, we primp and care for our bodies with probably too much attention and concern. We, let's just be honest. So the application is clear here. Love your wife with the same attention and concern that you give yourself. In verse 29, where it says, he feeds and cares for it, his body. You could translate those words feed and care. In the English, that's a good translation. It could also be translated this way, nourish and cherish. Nourish and cherish her. Just as you nourish and cherish your own body, you're to nourish and cherish your wife. You see, there, this is where we get to practice that thing Jesus taught in Matthew 7, 12, that we call the golden rule. Matthew 7, 12. So in everything, do unto others what you would have them do to you. By the way, this is a relational principle that's true in all our relationships. Your worst enemy, your boss, that person you can't stand, your neighbor who, who lets their dog bark all night long. But all relations, but absolutely in your, your relationship with your spouse, Matthew 7, 12 applies. So in, wait for it, everything Everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. That's the principle of caring for them as you care for yourself. And it's the same principle in mandate here in Ephesians 5. No man would intentionally take a hammer and crush his thumb. And so we're not to crush our wives. Protect your wife. No man would typically go days or weeks without food or water. But instead, some of us eat a little bit too much. And so we need to feed your wife's soul, nourish her heart, care for her body like you care for yours. No guy would intentionally cut off his hand or a finger. Nobody would plan on doing that. So don't cut off your wife. 
Stay connected to her with her emotionally and physically. Stay connected. No sane person on the planet would stick his hand in a fire or burn it on purpose. So guys, don't burn your wife through verbal, emotional, or physical abuse. Treat her with tender, loving care. And by the way, I, I occasionally, I, when I talk about this, I have a woman come up and make it sound like I'm some weak person that needs to be pampered all the time. I'm not saying you're weak. I think most women are way stronger than the men. I know my wife's stronger than me in many, 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 many ways. That's not the point. The point is I want to treat her as well as and better than I even treat myself and pamper her, care for her. So first, love her no matter what, until it hurts you, no matter what. Second, care for her with tender, loving care. Here's one final thing we'll consider today. Number three, commit to the process of becoming one. Now, don't check out for me. Some of you think, well, I don't know. Come in one, I get it, blah, blah, blah. No. Commit, keyword, to the process. Second important word in this. Look at verse 31. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. If you've gone to a wedding in your life, you've probably heard this verse or seen it referred to. And what I want you to understand, though, is this phrase here, will become, is an important phrase that's often missed. In the original language of the New Testament, in the Greek, that is in both a present and future tense. What does that mean? That means that it's both an occasion and an ongoing event. It is both an event and an ongoing experience of becoming one. It's not just one and done. I tell couples all the time when I'm in premarital counseling or, or sitting down and talking to people, I say, it's, it, your becoming one is both an event and a process. In the wedding ceremony, there's a legal oneness that takes place. According to the law and the state of Washington or wherever you get married, you know, I now pronounce you husband and wife. You're, you are one, legally. In the wedding bed, there's a physical oneness that takes place. But listen to me, it takes a lifetime. I've been married 46 years this July. And I'm telling you, and I think you guys are, you got me beat by what, you're 50-something? Not yet. Oh, I'm, here's the thing. It takes a lifetime, though. You agree with that, right? It takes a lifetime. It takes a lifetime to get good at this. Becoming one flesh is not something that just happens, and it's not one and done. It's an ongoing process. And we need to be committed to the process of becoming one, and that implies many things. But let me cover the most important thing today. Being committed to the process means that you'll invest in the process. That may sound like a duh or obvious, but trust me, it's not. Becoming one means you've got to invest in the process of becoming one. You'll invest time, energy, and the work that is required to make a, a marriage good and even better to great. Too often, I see couples who've given up on their marriage. And sadly, uh, too many times, they end up, by the time they end up in my office or talking to me, they've, they've already given up. It's too little, too late. They've, they've, they should have come a lot earlier than they did. Maybe they feel defeated. Maybe they're frustrated or fed up. Maybe the bubble of romance is gone and they're depressed uh, by what the reality of their marriage is like right now. But listen to me. This is a very simple, very important truth. If you really want to make your marriage work, you'll find a way. If you really don't, you'll find an excuse. We humans do what we want to do. Have you noticed that? We do. We, we're really good. We really, really are good. At, I have 20 Hawaiian shirts in my closet. I saw this one, and I needed it. And I talked my wife into it. I need, I need, I need. She says, so now I have a deal with her. I buy one, I have to give up one. It's like, it's, it really sucks. But, <laughs> but here's the deal. We, we always find a way to do what we want to do. And I'm telling you, if you really want to make your marriage work, you'll find a way. If you really don't, you'll find an excuse. Now, having said that, I know it takes two. I understand. Some of you think, well, I get everything I could, and it just, I understand, and I applaud that, I get that, and I, I, I understand that reality. But what I'm saying is it starts right here in our hearts. Will you commit to the process of becoming one? And it is hard work. And sometimes you're going to need lots of help along the way. I mentioned that we were coming up on 46 years of marriage. Well, um, five years into our marriage, two kids into our marriage, I told her I wanted a divorce, that I was done. I'd wandered far from God and had uh, all sorts of issues in my life and was doing a lot of stupid things. And I got to the point where I said, I'm, I'm done. I want a divorce. Now, thank God I had some people in my life who spoke the truth and love to me, kicked me in the tush, and said, you know, you can, you can make that choice you want to, and it's not going to go well. Or you can choose God, and he'll help you. And we went through two years, two-year process, 
two years, at least two years of healing and, and counseling and help. And there were lots of times during that time where both of us said, I'm not sure this is worth it, but I'm so glad that we stayed the course. It requires lots of work. And you must invest in the process. And the process, listen, it ain't easy. It's work. I'm going to show you a, a diagram. Some of you have seen this before. I think it's one of the best things that I ever have given to our church regarding relationships and marriage. And it's the process, the four stages of recurring agape love. The four stages. And I'm going to show you four things that happen. And it always starts with romance. It, every relationship starts right there. You are so madly in love with him. You doodle his name on things. You just think about her all day long. You just want to be with her. And you just, you can't, you can't touch each other enough. And you're like, you know, this all the time. And, and you open the door for her. And you treat her like she's a queen. And, and I mean, you, 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 she, she never argues with you. And you're in that romance stage. It's awesome. It's wonderful. But romance always leads to the next stage, which is trouble. Every relationship and absolutely every marriage goes from romance to something goes sideways. There's some sort of trouble. Unexpected, you know, thing happens. Unmet expectation and unmet expectations always lead to conflict. And so romance leads to trouble and it just, it happens. And I, I, I love telling, in premarital, telling couples this. Guys, I know right now you just think you're going to be the happiest couple ever. You're going to have the best marriage ever. But I'm promising you that it might be days, it might be weeks, it might be months, but sooner or later you're going to hit trouble. And it's going to come. It happens in every marriage. And then following trouble is the next, and I call it the valley of disillusionment. The valley of the shadow of death. You get there and you're thinking, this is not what I signed up for. Why does he, can he not pick up his own stinking socks? What is wrong with him? How many, I, I am not his mate. Does she not know how to make scrambled eggs for the love of Pete? How many times can you burn scrambled eggs? And you go through this valley of disillusionment where you're there and you're thinking, this is not what I signed up for. And here's what we want in that valley. This is just humans. We want romance. Where's the hot, you know, where's the, I want that. And all too often it's in that valley of disillusionment that people go, I'm done. And they bail. They check out. They get out. And they're looking for romance in all the wrong places, and so they go there. But listen to me. For those who stay the course, for those who walk through the valley of the shadow of death, through disillusionment, here's where it ends up. Fourth, and joy. Joy is not happy. Oh, it's not giddiness. Joy is, you know what? We just went through hell together, and we're still together. Joy is, I, I know you're committed to me. Joy is, I know that you care about me. Joy is, I know that I care about you. Joy is, I know that God is greater than our trouble, greater than our, even though we walked through the valley of the shadow of death, we were never alone. God was with us. Joy is that sense of, you know what? We went through a tough time. Maybe it was a tough day, a tough week, a tough month, a tough decade. But we stayed the course, and that brings joy. And joy, are you ready? Wait for it. This is the best part. Joy always leads to. <laughs> Woo! That's why I say it's the four recurring stages of love. Because it always leads back to romance again. It's like, I am, uh, you are so amazing. And, and, and then the next thing, how many of you have ever had a fight and ends really well? You know what I'm talking about? There are minors in the room, so I'm just going to leave it with a fight that ends really well. Uh, my, my point here is that you can have micro cycles. Do you know that that can happen sometimes like in an hour? Oh, you're amazing. Thank you, honey. You're just so incredible. You did what? Oh, for heaven's sakes. Okay, we'll get through this. Hey, give me a big kiss. <laughs> yeah, that can happen micro moments in an hour or a day or a week, or you can have these macro moments. And I don't say this lightly because I know we went through a macro cycle for two years where it's like, is this ever going to get better? And it goes on and on. And I understand. But here's what I need you to hear it is a process. And that's normal. And it's a process of, that requires hard work. And the fruit of committed covenant relationship with your wife, with that woman sitting next to you, is worth its weight and gold. When I asked my wife what she wanted most for Mother's Day, she said, just you. Uh, <laughs> then I bought her an iPad. It was awesome. <laughs> Guys, for Mother's Day and every day, every day, celebrate your wife and the gift that she is to you and your children. 
and do it by doing at least these three things. And go back to this passage in Ephesians 5 on a fairly regular basis. Say, Lord, uh, heart check. How am I doing here? Here's the bottom line. No matter what it takes or how hard it might be sometimes, the best gift you can give to your wife on Mother's Day and every day is to love her like Jesus loves his bride. Here's how I'm going to finish today. I'm going to ask you just to uh, do something with me. In fact, Tina, if you drop the lights. Ladies, if you're here today and you're a mom, a grandma, a mom in waiting, you're a woman that wants to have a child and, and you're not yet pregnant, maybe you've even struggled, and I, I'm so sensitive that my own daughter has been through infant fertility. But if you're a mom, grandma, mom in waiting, I'm going to ask you just to stand right now. I'm not going to do anything to single you out and embarrass you, but would you just stand because I want to pray for you. Go ahead, just stand up, please. Now, why am I asking you to do this? Well, because I want to know that you, you matter. You matter enough for me to take a moment just to pray over you and to pray for you. And I'm going to ask the, the, uh, the others around you, if they feel comfortable doing so, to just place their hand maybe on your arm or to take your hand. But just touch that woman next to you right now. Now, let me pray. Father, I know um, that Mother's Day is something humans created, probably Hallmark created it, Lord. We, it's a holiday that, that came about because of something um, a human decided to do. But I do know this. I know, God, that it is, a, it is an awesome opportunity for us to be reminded that this woman that we have our hand on right now, that this mom, wife, grandma, this mom in waiting, she matters. She matters so much. And I know, Lord, there have been way too many times in my 46 years where I haven't treated Laura that way. Forgive me again. Help me again. Well, Lord, I pray for these women I pray for those that are standing here right now who want to be moms and they're not yet. Maybe they've gone through a season of struggle and depression. Lord, would you do what only I know you can do? Reach into their hearts right now. Bring hope. Encourage them. Where they're shattered and brokenhearted, Lord, just wrap your, your heart around their hearts right now. The scripture said that you're close to the brokenhearted, so be close to them right now, Lord. Let them feel your presence. For the moms and the grandmas that are standing here, and, and maybe they struggle at times with depression, and they feel like they've failed their kids, failed their husband, that they've not been all they could be. Lord, would you just set them free? We all are imperfect. We're all broken. We're all far from what we will be when we're with you forever. And Lord, set them free from guilt. Set them free from shame. Set them free. Right now, I break the power of that, that darkness that's been over them that has caused them to just be so focused on their, their lack or their, their, their weaknesses rather than on you and on what you've done in them and are doing in them. So Lord, lift that darkness now. For the moms that have cried out a thousand times, thousand times, Lord, for their kids, their grandkids, for their husbands to come to know you. Today, would you just remind them that you've heard every prayer and you've seen every tear and that you, you're near to them too and that you're working and their children and their grandchildren and their spouse, that you're working, Lord, that even though at times they feel like it's, there's nothing happening, God, you always are working. But for all of these dear women, Lord, that I love and I appreciate, I just pray, Lord, that you would encourage them, that you would bless them. And right now, they would, as real as, as, as they may have a hand on them right now, that you would, they would feel the presence and the power of God on them and through them. And encourage them right now and bless them, I pray. I pray it in the mighty, amazing, and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Let's give her up one more time for these moms, would you? Let's all stand together. Would you stand with me? Thank you, ladies. We're going to finish with one last song. Uh, let this just seal in your heart what God wants to do, and I'll come back.
God from God, light from light. We believe in one Jesus Christ, breaking through the darkest of nights to say, You alone can say. Hope of hope, strength of strength. All our sin is dead in the grave. Only one has power enough to say, You alone can say, You alone can say.
I love that song and the promise that's contained in it. But I love you guys. I want to thank you for being a part, especially the moms and grandmas and moms of waiting. Thanks for coming today. Uh, next week, we start that series called Rest, and I promise you it's going to be encouraging and challenging. And I started working on it last week, some, and it's like, wow, I needed it. Usually, God brings me to a place where I preach what I need the most, so <laughs> that's it. It'll be fun. Uh, ladies, don't forget that we've got, if you didn't get one, there's one of the little fans that says that you're, uh, you're from your greatest fans, available if you didn't pick one up. And then there's photo booth with the balloons out in the lobby. Love you guys. See you next week. Thanks for being here. Happy Mother's Day.